All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Charles Rayburn. I'm the senior uh, customer success manager here at ServiceNow. Um, we've started these series about a year ago um, to kind of help out with answering questions that we feel or that my team feels uh, from customers such as yourselves as they're meeting with the monthly, quarterly, emails, things like that on hot topics that you would love to have the senior subject matter expert invited to talk about. So the format is pretty simple. The first 30 minutes is all about um, the topic at hand. So today's topic is ITBM demand management, best practices overview. We have our subject matter expert here, um, Rob Erickson. He's going to kind of go over what that what the topic nature is, probably provide a demonstration. And then the remaining 30 minutes is really about any questions you guys have and kind of where you're at in your journey uh, for Rob and others. And feel free to ask other clients or other customers as well that are on the line um, of questions that they may have uh, about what, kind of what, what they've seen and done with the space as well. So um, without further ado, Rob, go ahead, uh, I guess, introduce yourself a little bit more and then go ahead and take it away. You're on, you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint presentation here. We can see it fine All and right. we can hear you. Excellent. So yeah, my name is Rob Erickson. Uh, I'm a senior product manager in the IT business management uh, this is Unit of ServiceNow. Uh, I've been with ServiceNow for about six and a half years. I uh, spent the first four and a half or so in our, uh, what was then called professional services, now called uh, customer outcomes, um, doing implementations. And primarily most of that was doing implementations of PPM, uh, including demand and resource and project management. So got a lot of uh, experience in the space of implementing demand management, but also then the last couple of years I've been working on, uh, working with the product team. Um, on uh, improving the product and, and uh, doing demos and such. So um, I'm based out of Minneapolis, so it's it's been hot here as well. We've had 90s for about uh, had about six straight days, which is uh, not very common for June. So I think it's just something around the country where it's uh, it's been a warm one so far. All right, so uh, I will primarily be giving a demo, but before that, I did want to just give kind of a little bit of an overview of where demand management fits within IT business management. So IT business management is all around kind of enterprise planning. We've got our strategy, we've got our alignment and execution, um, basically identifying, you know, what do we want to work on from a strategy perspective? How do we then align our workforce and our projects and programs to that work that we have identified? And then ultimately, how do we execute on it? Is it via kind of a waterfall method of project management? Is it a, a via using an agile methodology or even scaled agile? So those are some of the, the main elements. However, we do need to find a way to get work basically into this pipeline. How do we, how do we identify what that work should be and then potentially prioritize it to make sure that then it aligns with our strategies and can, can be executed on. So that's really where demand management fits and kind of this, this left box here with it for, for IT business management. So um, that's about all the slide where I've got. I want to just jump into a demo. So any questions just basically about where demand management fits before we move into the demo? All right. If not, I'm going to go into our um, ServiceNow instance. And so basically I'm logged in as Brian Marshall, who's our demand manager slash business relationship manager. And he's the one that would be managing demand within our particular organization. So the first thing I wanted to show is I wanted to go into the idea portal, which so ideation is not exactly the same as demand. It really, it's it can often work alongside of demand or potentially instead of demand, depending on how an organization um, brings work into its environment. So ideation really is a low barrier for entry that allows uh, members of an organization to submit things that work that they believe should be done. So ideas can range anywhere from things, you know, it can work as kind of like a suggestion box for the organization. It could be very much more specific where let's say you've got, got certain products and you want to ask for uh, enhancements to those particular products. Um, but really, I think the, the core concept is that you don't have to put too much information up front. It's something where you can submit that idea, then there's someone 
maybe multiple people that are there to to go through those ideas and determine what should we move forward on. It's a way to prevent the organization from working on things that really aren't um, of high value. And it's also, you know, the as we get into the demand process, which is a much higher um, barrier for for approval. Um, it, even it, it makes sure that you don't necessarily go through that process without uh, the, the the items that you're doing having a lot of value. So you really are trying to prevent wasting time from your employees, like filling out a lot of information on business cases and things like that. If something is really it's kind of a non-starter or something. Um, uh, how this idea portal works is basically someone would log in. There's a set of categories that are available, and these categories are very configurable to your environment. Um, so really the categorization we recommend would depend on how you've broken out your work. It might be things like per business unit, it might be per product, it might be a little bit more generic depending on how you then promote those ideas. Um, you can have multiple idea portals as well within your within your service now instance so different departments could have their own idea portals if you want to split that out. Um, it's something that's that's fairly easy to configure. Then within the idea portal you have things like up and down voting so users can come in and you know if they see an idea that's similar to one that they want they could potentially upvote it. So that's a way that the idea manager can prioritize and say okay these are the things that have the most upvotes let's move that forward within the process. Uh, some other things is you can add comments to these. Um, and then if you're creating a new idea, we use machine learning to basically do a search of ideas that are already out on the system so someone can check and see, is there an idea that's already out there that I would just want to upvote or add a comment to as opposed to creating my, uh, my own idea. All right. So then once we've we basically the the idea manager has determined that they want to promote something that's when they can actually go into the idea itself and they would go into the platform view. So most users only have this view where they can add comments or up or down vote an idea, but the idea manager can go into the platform view and they can do something that's called creating a task that's associated to the idea. So this create task is going to, to basically move it along in the process. So there's different ways that it can move forward. You could potentially create a project or an agile epic or story or a safe epic feature or story directly from this idea if you don't need it to go through the demand process. And that's something within each organization you have to decide is what is what is the barrier for entry? Is it something that's like a, a simple enhancement that's that's you know highly valuable that we don't feel it needs to go through a demand process to vet it and to, to gather additional information. But typically the workflow is that it would become a demand next and go into that workflow. So we can click on demand, click on OK. And now a demand has been created that was associated to this idea. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to show with idea, just show you that that is a potential entry point into demand. Um, it, like I said, it could also put, uh, be used as a replacement for demand if you don't want to go through the full demand process. Um, but, uh, but I think that's, that's really how, how ideation works. Any questions there before we move over into demand? All right. And a lot of the things when I was doing implementations, one of the, you know, it's it's really, you know, there there were a lot of questions from customers. Should I use idea? Should I use demand? I think the key concept is idea, like I said, is very low barrier for entry. Um, it's something where you're trying to gather as much as you can. The downside to that is you then need to provide resources that are going to review those ideas and decide what's going to move forward. And then there's typically more if you if you open things up to anyone can submit an idea. It's great because everyone can have a voice. However, then it's more work on the, the back end for your idea managers to sort through, figure out you know, what's most valuable and decide whether things are gonna move forward or not. There was one quick question there, Rob. Yeah, sure. Where does CIM module fit in and how does it connect to idea and demands? CIM, so I believe that's the, uh, um, I remember exactly the, is that continual uh, improvement? Yeah, I think so. That's yeah, I think that's another record type within ServiceNow. So you could create ideas from your continual improvement records. Um, you can create demands directly from them. It really depends on your process. Um, that's I think more a part of the ITSM portion of ServiceNow. So they definitely can be connected. We don't have a an out of the box uh, connection with them. However, like I said, it's because they're both in the platform. It can be pretty easily connected. Um, just, I mean, I would say if you're collecting a lot of information from your CIM records, I would say you may want to go directly into demand as opposed to coming into idea. But if you want to use things like up or down voting, it could certainly be done. 
Okay. And then one more question was from Mary Jane. When converting an idea to a demand, is there a way to force the submitter to complete the demand form with the fields we require? Uh, that would be something that you'd add as part of your workflow. You basically would need to find a way to assign that demand to the to the submitter instead of uh, assigning it. Uh, it basically is, it doesn't have, out of the box, we don't have a, an assignment of demand. Typically you would go in and a demand manager would either pick up that demand or if you have a demand coordinator, they would assign it to a particular demand manager. But what you could do, there, there's a, actually a couple of different things you could do. Um, you could have the demand manager basically or actually, you could you could set the assign to uh, to the to that submitter instead of assigning it to a demand manager directly, or you could create a demand task assigned to that submitter, uh, basically telling them you need to fill out these particular portions of the demand form. So it really uh, depends on whether you want to use that that kind of parent demand record or use demand tasks to to help coordinate that activity. But like I said, it's not out of the box, but it's something very easy to configure. Yeah. That's it for now. Continue. Okay. All right. So let's move over to our back to our GUI. And so there's there's a couple other ways that demands can get created and get into your system. So we showed how an idea can be converted to a demand. You can take other ServiceNow records and create demands directly from them. Uh, we've done things with customers where you could create a demand from a problem and bring over certain fields. Uh, you could create a demand from this uh, CIM record. Um, another way is you could potentially have a catalog entry for a demand. So again, if you want your users to, instead of like going into the, the typical interface and creating a demand, they could just uh, have an item in the catalog um, that would be for, for our demand. So let's do our office hours demand here. You can fill out some information around you. Things like any of the fields that are collected on demand can be put on this, on this form. So you can say this idea business area, you can align it to a particular strategy if you wish. You can have, you know, you'd want to probably have like a start and end date for when you desire that this would actually be executed on. Uh, you can put in an estimated cost and benefit. Now we'll get into costs and benefits in the demand uh, a little more deeply in the demo as we move forward and choose things like a t-shirt size. Here we, we're collecting things like business justification if we want, business areas affected, known risks. So these are all items that are typically on your standard demand form. But what we're doing here is capturing them up front in a, uh, in a catalog item. Um, and then you can, you know, you can see there's certain fields that are mandatory that have the they have the little star next to them. So you could make a lot of these other fields mandatory as well. It really depends on your organization and what level of detail you want along the process. When someone's submitting a demand, you may not want to require that they put all this information in. You may want to make it optional, but at some point within the workflow of the demand, you may change that and say, okay, now if it, in order to move forward, it needs to uh, it needs to be a mandatory field. There was one quick question too mm -hmm. from Joella. Uh, that was a form that the customer must create to do so as a catalog item, correct? Also, can this be placed on the portal? Yes, it can be placed on the portal. Um, so I just had a quick, uh, for demo purposes, I, I put it on my uh, uh, my favorites menu, but it's something that yeah would be available in the service portal. Um, you'd be able to identify you know what category it would show up under uh, underneath, uh, and then. Uh, it, we, it's, this is just a simple uh, record producer item that, that, that we created. So um, it was pretty easy then to map from the fields that we had on this form back to our, to our demand field. So it, it's, it's, this, this was something that we configured, but it was a very light configuration to be able to do that. All right, so you can also add attachments if you wish to this particular entry. And so now we're gonna submit the demand. And so now we've got a new demand in our system again. Right. So let's go back over to our standard interface and um, we can go in and look at what we have. Now we've created kind of a custom dashboard for this, for our demos, this demand manager dashboard. So you could create something similar within your environment. Uh, it's very simple, just you know, doing counts of numbers of demands, forecast of costs for demands, um, you know, different things of where, where different states that the demands are in. Um, and so then if we go to our all demands list, we can put in the most recently created. Let's go ahead and do that. It's a field on our list view. 
So as your demand, you know, as your demand managers use this, you'd have to determine what's what is the way that they would want to use it. Do you want to auto route them to particular demand managers based on attributes of the demand? Do you want to make it just one big bucket where people would kind of pull things in based on the information? Um, that's really each organization needs to, to determine how they'd want to kind of initially prioritize and do the triage for these demands. I think, you know, what I've seen with a lot of customers that I've worked with is they have kind of a demand coordinator that would then assign it out to a demand manager. Um, I think to that earlier question, you could assign things out to the to a submitter initially to make sure that they filled out all of the information that they needed if, it, if something came in as an idea. I'm going to do with this demand, the one that I just created, I'm going to assign it to myself, Brian, as a demand manager. Typically, you wouldn't have the submitter be the same as the demand manager, but this is just for, for this demo. We're going to do that, and I'm going to click on Save. All right, now, a few things about this demand record. Um, you'll notice there is a ribbon across the top, top showing the different states of the demand. Um, I just want to walk through that first. So draft is typically the state that demand will first come in as. Um, it is typically something you want to leave something in draft uh, that will allow a submitter to continue to edit it before it gets submitted. Now, I think that this would typically be used if you're creating demands directly, not necessarily using ideas to become demands or submitting it through some kind of uh, service portal. Um, it really just gives, gives that demand user the opportunity to do their updates before it's officially submitted and it goes to your demand manager. Uh, so often what we'll see is this state might get skipped and we go directly to submitted if you're using something like an idea to demand or uh, using a, a service catalog item to a demand. So once something then gets to submitted, that is when it typically will go to the demand manager and a lot of the information will be filled in. Now, again, it's really up to your organization to determine who fills in that information. Is it the demand manager who's going out and collecting the information or is it a submitter or do you have tasks that are getting sent out to users that are helping you populate that demand? So one thing with this demo, uh, we created a, a workflow, a sample workflow using uh, uh, Flow Designer in ServiceNow. We automatically created a couple of demand tasks for this particular demand item. Uh, so this is something, again, you would have to configure, but it's fairly easy based on some of the characteristics of demands, you could automatically generate tasks out to people if you needed them to, let's say, estimate resources, estimate costs, if there's any other work that needs to be done just as part of this demand process. Now, I do want to put in a caveat here. This is not intended to replace uh, execution like project tasks or or agile stories if that's the way you're, you're doing your execution this is really these tasks are intended only for collecting the information needed to basically fulfill this or get through this demand process to to fill in the necessary information to to uh, populate the demand and allow uh, it to be um, compared against other demands in your system before it moves forward to actual work execution all right, so um, within that submitted state, basically that, like I said, is where you would fill out a lot of your information. I'm gonna go into more details in that in just a minute, um, but I did wanna kind of get through the flow and just talk through some of the other states that, that you'd go through. Uh, there's the screening state. So once you go into screening, that is really, you've populated all the information that you need about demand. Screening is all around assessing that demand and determining, like doing some scoring for it. Uh, we'll talk about the, the options that you have for scoring the demand. Uh, there's, you can use, what's called assessment surveys, where uh, a survey gets sent out to a user. Um, it can, you can also just do, you know, take information from your demand record and make that part of your score. Or it's something you could just, you know, especially if you're not as mature in the demand space, you may just want to manually score each demand. Um, again, that, uh, you know, typically what you might see is people would score their demands all very high and you want to some at some point add some you know, science to the to the process to see to make sure your demands are scored appropriately to commensurate it with, with your value and and risk. But it's something that you know, like I said, if you if you're not ready for that, you could just have someone manually score it and then someone else could review it. There was one quick question too from mm -hmm. Randy. How do you handle projects that are non strategic? So we have you know, right now we basically out of the box, we have this, this concept of category and type where everything. You know, so so for strategic things, you have things like projects, epic stories. Um, then we have a operational that has typically change and defects. You could also create, you know, you, you can adjust these lists. So if you had something that is an operational project 
or some other type of project that's non-strategic, you could either add a category of non-strategic and you could still create a project as an output from that, but you'd want to then, um, when that project gets generated, you want to make sure that it, um, it it's identified as a non-strategic project. Also, you may have a slightly different workflow based on whether it's strategic or not strategic. There might be information that you'd gather that would be only for strategic projects. And for non-strategic, you may have a, a lower bar barrier of uh, ent or entry of what data needs to be gathered. So that is, you, you can use automation within the platform to say, oh, if I choose non-strategic and project, then it's going to basically some, cause some of these fields to disappear. I think we have that. If I, if I choose an enhancement instead of a project in the financials area, a lot of the fields disappear. If I change it back to a project, then it's still collecting those fields. So that's something that you'd have to consider. So it's, it's definitely uh, uh, something that, that uh, can be accounted for within, within demand. Great. And then one more, what has mm -hmm. been the best way to have seen that you have seen when you are just starting out to scoring demands? I'd say the manual scoring and having guidance to users to provide that manual scoring, simply because trying to build out a, a system of a numeric scoring where it's based on fields or based on assessment surveys can be very difficult. So I, I view it as kind of a maturity path where initially you might do some manual scoring with oversight. So it might be like a committee that's scoring it as opposed to like a single user or something like that, where then you'd, you'd say, okay, this is the value we're getting out of this. This is the risk. And you can use other metrics, our out of the box metrics for, for, for scoring and demand or risk and value, but you could potentially use others if, if there are different um, scoring me mechanisms that are important for your organization. I've also seen some organizations just do a single value score and hard rank basically on that single value score. But I think that's the, that's the first path that I would recommend. Second path then is I would, recommend using um, data that's on the form that's filled out. So if there's cost data, if you can uh, you know, identify your ROI for your particular demand, that might be what you determine is, uh, would, would set the value. And then the third stage of maturity is really doing those assessment surveys where you can basically identify who are your stakeholders that you'd want to send out surveys to. Those users can then uh, fill out those assessments and that would determine some of the, the scoring. Now, sometimes based on your organization, it might be you might choose some kind of hybrid between uh, those level two and three where you're you know, taking data from the form and combining it with assessments. But again, that's, that's a little more complex to configure. And often what I've seen with organizations where they try to get too, too fancy with scoring is they build these elaborate systems of, you know, based on all these different fields, let's try to auto score it, but then people learn how to game the system. And they basically set those fields to values that they know will, will provide a high value score. And unless you have things, some kind of level of oversight to that, where, you know, people will actually be called out on it if they've, if they've identified you know, that their demands are more valuable or, or less valuable than what they identified in the demand record, um, then it's it's really just an exercise in um, uh, exercise in futility, really. So, I mean, it's something where I think it's more around you know the scores that you put in. Try to make sure that they are valid and that 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 you know use your projects that are in the past and go back to like what was if we had put in a demand for this project, what would have been our value score and how do we then adjust our scoring such that we are we're making sure that we prioritize those high value those those high value initiatives that that we'd want to be, uh, execute uh, either via like projects or or via agile work hopefully that wasn't too long winded of an answer i see we're getting close to our 30 minute uh, and i still have a few things that i want to be able to demo so maybe i'll i'll keep going yeah you're good to go rob okay all right so uh so a few other things. So that was the screening. And so once all the screening is done, once the scoring has been done, now there is an out of the box rule that if you have, are using assessment surveys and all the surveys have been completed, it's going to automatically move over to the qualified state. Uh, you could also have the demand manager manually move something over to the qualified state, um, even if e whether or not you're using assessment surveys. So the qualified state is really where it is evaluated. And typically we recommend some level of governance where you'd have committee or some kind of group that's going to then look at all of the demands that are currently in that qualified state to determine what's going to move forward. Now, a lot depends on your planning process. If you're using annual planning, you may want to pull, have all your demands together that are going to be potential work for that year. And so like basically, you know, maybe in third quarter or start of fourth quarter this year, we'd look at everything that's in a qualified state that we'd want to do for next year. If you're more flexible and you have demands coming in and you're, you're um, doing either like a quarterly 
um, planning process you might or or even you know monthly planning process you might then have those meetings every month and then everything that's new that's come in as qualified you may then evaluate and you may even evaluate it against work that's currently in progress and decide oh we don't want to do this anymore we it's you know we've had shifting priorities within the organization and you basically let's look at the other work that's potentially out there and see if you know should we if this new project that came came in that's a higher priority that more aligns with our strategic focus as an organization or if there's something like a pandemic that comes through and we have to really change our strategy how do we then you know prioritize the work that's out there that we need to do so that's that's a ways that once something gets into qualified that you would then do that kind of analysis uh have have either a committee or um some other method of having review of those items, and then it moves to an approved state uh, for the items that, that, that it's decided that they're going to move forward. And that approved state then typically would go along with creating your execution record. So if it's a project that's going, that you're using, if, you, if you're using project management, you can create a project. If you're using Agile, you can create an epic or a story. Um, similar if you're using SAFE, you can create SAFE records. And then once the execution of work is done, that's when the item is typically moved to completed. Now, there is a, there's an option. Um, you can either have the item go to completed as soon as you've created that execution record, or you can wait till that execution record is completed. So like, you could wait until, the, you can wait, you can have it go to completed if the project is, is created, or you can have it go to completed when the project is, is, is finished. All right, uh, a few other things I definitely wanted to show. Um, so when you're in this submitted state, all the data that can be collected. So we've got a lot of things that are out of the box. Um, portfolio is very important. This, if you are using portfolios, it also can determine who your stakeholders are. You can identify portfolio stakeholders that would always be added to as stakeholders to that particular demand if you've selected that portfolio. So I just selected, actually, let's see, it looks like IT doesn't have any, let's use HR. I know there's some stakeholders there. So if I change the portfolio to HR here, I can see that I have some stakeholders that are automatically added and we can determine whether they're assessment recipients or not. Um, other information that you can collect around programs, business units, departments. If you know who the project manager of the project would be, you can actually fill that information in now and when the project is created, it would be assigned as the project manager. Um, if you're using uh, our application portfolio management, you can identify business applications associated with this demand. You can identify business capabilities. Um, you can choose what kind of government governance, you know, so there's a lot of data you can collect. Then we've got our business case tab, which is has strategies and goals. If you've if you've defined those within ServiceNow, you can identify what strategies and goals this this demand aligns to. And then there's a lot of information around the business case that you can fill out. Now, this is very flexible as far as what you would need. I mean, some organizations are going to have all this information, some are only going to collect a few of these fields. Some may have their own fields that they need to collect different sets of metadata that are not out of the box. Um, just like, you know, ServiceNow as a platform, it's very, very flexible as far as uh, how, you know, you can add or remove fields from forms and, and make fields mandatory. So it's really up to you to determine what data is necessary. And also as you move from state to state, you may say, okay, before we can move from submitted to screening, we're gonna need to fill out these six fields or something like that. So that's, that's again, something that's very flexible you can configure the system to figure out what data is absolutely mandatory versus what data might be more optional. Um, we have our financials tab. And so the financials, we put in a, a number for our capital expenses, but that is going to be overwritten by, there's a couple of related lists on this form, our cost plans and benefit plans drive what's going to show up in this financial information. If we don't have any cost plans, we can just type in a number here. If we want to just say, you know, we think it's going to cost us, 100,000 of CapEx, 100,000 of OpEx, and we want to put in our financial benefit, you can just mainly type it in and not use cost plans. But cost plans allow you to be more granular, both from a, you know, what is what is the, the cost actually coming from and what are the fiscal periods that that cost is associated to. So as part of our this demo, we created a couple of resource plans automatically. And so resource plans are basically how we're, we think these are the resources we're going to need for this particular project if it moves forward. Then from resource plans, cost plans would be automatically created to determine here are the costs of those resources that we uh, have identified. Now I could create a new cost plan. So if I've got something that's, let's say it's not resource specific, I just wanna say, you know, this is some hardware that I need to buy. Uh, I can identify what the cost type is. And so I can say if it's CapEx or OpEx, so I'm gonna say it's CapEx. Uh, you can choose if you're, you know, if you're using, you have hardware in the system via asset management, you could use existing hardware, or you could just say, this is gonna be, $50,000 and then how many units. So let's say we've got to get 
two of whatever we're getting. Uh, then you have to choose your start and end fiscal period. By default, it's going to take the start and end fiscal period of your demand. Um, you can adjust these if, if it's going to go outside of that window or it could be a smaller subset of that window. And you could also make it potentially like a recurring cost. So if it's something that you want to make it a monthly cost, so everything is going to happen per fiscal period, you can also do that. So once I submit that, that's going to add that cost plan to my demand as a line item. And then it's also going to update my capital expense up here. It would up if I had chose, chosen OPEX, it would have updated my operating expense. And it's going to show up in my total plant costs. So you can basically build out the costs of your demand using those cost plans. Um, so then there is also the concept of benefit plans. So we're working on ways to do non-financial benefits. This is mostly for financial benefits, where you know, if, if we've got, so here's our return, you know, basically we got new purchases, let's say, that, that are going to come in based on. Um, based on implementing this project. You can then identify when is that, when is when are those financial period, uh, benefits going to come in? Let's say it's gonna be, you know, basically like one month after our uh, project ends and it's gonna go on for 12 months. And then we can identify, you know, what's our benefit gonna be? So let's say it's gonna be a million dollars and you can identify what currency that you want. You can choose hard or soft benefits, but again, because this is financially focused, it's really gonna be more of a hard benefit. And like I said, in the future, we're looking at doing more non-monetary benefits, including those in addition to our, to our uh, monetary benefits. So if I submit that, now we see that I see a financial benefit and that field, because I've used a benefit plan and now becomes read only. So if I wanna add additional benefits, I have to use those benefit plan records. And then it's gonna, it's calculated a, uh, financial return based on taking the financial benefit minus the total plan cost and calculated an ROI percentage. And again, that and out of the box, that financial benefit will ultimately end up uh, uh, being part of our scoring of this demand. All right, I've been talking for a while. Any questions have, uh, that have come up? There is one from mm -hmm. um, Rob. It yes. says resource plans drive the cost plans. Are there any evaluations of resource availability that would level the demand schedule? So checking uh, resource availability is possible. So um, that's where you would typically use, there's a like a resource reports that are available uh, and a resource workbench that would allow you to see um, when resources are available. That's something that it's, that's something that you would go typically directly from um, the demand record. You'd, you'd go into your resource reports. And that's where you could check on different teams. So basically like if you need a, you know you need a specific group um, for your demand. So let's look at availability and we're gonna choose a group. Let's say it's our database group. Uh, let's see if we got, actually let's choose our analyst group. Changed a couple of these names here. And so then you can go ahead and choose your, basically your start and end date. So if this is happening this year, I only care about uh, like June and July of this year. I can then go out and run a resource report that's gonna show me the availability of all my users within that time frame. So that's one of the ways, and if I see, you know, and this is something that it may happen when you're initially creating the demand, that you'd go out and check availability of your resources. It may be something that happens during that um, approval process where, you know, if the committee is looking at things, they would look at the different demands and the availability of resources for those. And it might be something that you'd need to, to make some adjustments on, on how that would work. We also have something called our scenario planning workbench. Uh, don't know if we have time to go into that, but that is really something where you can, for a particular portfolio, you can select the different projects and demands you wanna move forward with. And that would show you immediately, you know, are those resources gonna be available? Actually, that might be something I'll just show. Uh, really quickly here. So we've got this portfolio planning workbench, um, which is where you could potentially find, like you can basically see any of the projects or demands for a particular portfolio. Uh, and then within that, uh, you could then see what the resource implication would be. So here I've selected certain projects. You can see the ones with the green check boxes or the different projects within this portfolio we're gonna be moving forward with. You could also have demands there. And then you check on the resources list and see a heat map of any of the resources that are identified for that. And then you could basically adjust dates of your demands, 
um, to make sure that then your resources are going to are not going to be over allocated. All right. Any other questions? No, I okay. don't see. All right. And so we showed we created resource plans automatically via um, with our with our workflow uh, flow designer uh, in this particular uh, demo demand. But you could also add additional resource plans. Um, so you can go into the manage area. This would show you our different resource plans that have already been requested for this particular demand. And I can add new ones. And so this is all around resource management. I don't want to go too deep here, but this is where you could do an initial estimate of here are the resources that we need for this demand. Is it going to be members of a group? We could have a specific user or have something, someone from a specific role. You can choose hours after user person days. You set your time frame, and then you'd make that request. And as I was mentioning before, we have things like um, a rate model where based on the resources you've selected, it will estimate costs based on that rate model. So it could be, you know, you could have a default rate for all of your users. You could also build out separate rates based on role or based on uh, like title of the particular person uh, that, that would be requested or a particular group. Uh, and that would help you estimate what the costs are gonna be for those resources. All right. uh, if I may add one thing here, Rob, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because on the previous question, right, if you go back to the manage resource plans, uh, from there also in the resource finder, you can see the availability of the resources. Right. If you just yeah. click That's on, great, yeah. Great point. <laughs> great point. Yeah. yeah. So here's, you can see exactly the resources for these groups that I've requested. So here's for the financial analyst group and here for the project management group, I can see those at availability. Mm -hmm. And it's going to show you that time frame that you've selected for the, for your demand. All right. Oh, there is one more question. Mm -hmm. And that says, is that a recommendation for a phase one implementation when implementing demand module? So and, resource, yeah, I don't yeah. Yeah, know. You can, <laughs> and so I, I've typically, you know, where implementa implementations I've done, trying to get resource management off the bat is fairly challenging. Um, so, I mean, you can do somewhat, I would say, if you do basic resource management, that's something, but um, I think if you're doing an initial implementation, typically that that's something I would say it would be more of a, a phase two uh, activity for from a maturity perspective. But I don't know, I mean, if, Namida, if you've seen. Uh... Yeah, no, I know, I agree with you, Rob. Okay. okay. Yeah. But yeah, and it's something that too, you know, I think the mistake I've seen with customers is that they try to get too granular with resource management and get down to like, you know, trying to, to 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 fill every every hour for every resource and it really works much better if you're if you're using resource management more as a, a high level guide to say you know okay you know this this group we're up to like 150 percent we know they're over allocated we need to move some work around versus trying to get everybody up to exactly 100 percent all right uh, a couple other things so that's i guess most of what i wanted to show from a um in the submitted state so there are some other things that, you know, you, there are related lists here for things like requirements, risks, issues, decisions. Those kinds of, kinds of things are typically tracked on a project. Uh, we call our RIDAC items, but um, it can be started. If you know about a risk or an issue that's associated, it can, it can be identified during the demand. And then if you create a project from this demand, those will just carry over to that particular demand. The same thing with resource plans, cost plans, and benefit plans. If you create a project from this, all of those would just actually move over to the project. The, the data that you, cal you calculated in the financials would stay, but these resource plans would move over with the, with the demand once it's promoted. All right, so let's say that we're done filling out our information and we want to move this into the screening process. Okay, we're going to do that. And one thing I did want to mention, I, I talked about the states of a demand, the out of the box workflow. Uh, a couple of things, as you do an implementation kind of best practices that I've seen, typically like re, if you want to rename these, that's fine. Uh, there's no problem with that. Uh, the issue comes in is if you decide to create new states or replace these states, there is some risk there. Primarily with there, there is some automation that's happening. As I've moved from submitted to screening, that basically triggered the creation of these uh, of assessments to the to our assessment recipients. Um, it also, you know, some of the things like the scoring that's done uh, and collected will happen when you're moving from like screening to qualified. So if you removed one of these states from the flow, you'd have to 
do a lot of configuration work to make, you know, to recreate the either if you're using assessments or doing scoring. So I would typically recommend not changing this flow. You could potentially add states to your demand workflow. Um, but, uh, you know, again, that's something that you just need to keep in consideration the risks of those the automation that's taking place during our out of the box flow. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is you notice I've just been clicking buttons to, to be able to move forward in states. Um, that's something that you can definitely configure more of a um, uh, more of a workflow where basically the things are moved forward automatically or you may have approvals that take place before you can move from one state to another. You may not allow for like jumping ahead in, in from one state to the next. So that's just something within your process. Uh, you know, each customer needs to determine do they have any kind of gates within the demand process where they would want um, like some kind of approval or some other level of review before it would move forward within within the workflow. Um, there was one question too. And an easy call. question. Yeah, go ahead. Can you set up a flow where you skip steps? Absolutely. I think the only danger there was, you know, if there's any automation happening within that step, um, you would also bypass that automation. So, like, if you did want to use wanted to skip screening. Um, you basically need to make sure that you're not using assessment surveys because the assessment surveys are sent out when, when you get to the screening process. All right. Um, so uh, running a little low on time. I was, so I, let me, I will show you really quickly uh, the example of an assessment. So I'm going to impersonate, uh, let's see where our assessment recipients here. Um, let's impersonate Gracie. Yeah, I was just going to say, Rob, this has been really great. Um, uh, definitely continue with the demo. We can ask the questions as you go through. There's about 16 minutes left. So we'll, I'm going to launch the poll for those who might not be able to stay for the full hour. You guys can give us some feedback there. But definitely continue to have those questions coming in as Rob continues the demo. All right. So, uh, so here's the assessments that Gracie has been assigned. You can see here's our demand that has been identified. So she's going to take an assessment. Out of the box, our assessments are really on strategic alignment and risk. Uh, strategic alignment is, actually doesn't, doesn't factor into our overall score, but it's something that you can collect. So what's our, how is this aligning to our strategies? And then our risk is, is something that we're collecting as well. And typically you'd want something to be, you know, low risk for a particular demand and um, that would improve the score. The value is something that we're actually calculating. So I'm going to submit this. And if we had all of our risk uh, recipients uh, finish their surveys, then that would uh, automatically move the, the demand to a qualified state. Um, in this case, we're just going to have Gracie uh, complete her assessment survey. And let's go back into our demand. And there was one then, question too, while you pull that up from Joelle, is there a document of what steps uh, create automation? believe that's in our online documentation for demand but uh if not it's something we i think you know, when we do an implementation we typically make sure to identify uh all those all those items um, and really the the primary automations are send out sent uh the sending of the, the assessment recipients when we get to screening and then um the roll up of all the scores when we get to qualified All right, uh, so I've finished that assessment. Um, what we'll do is the value. So there's there's two major metrics that are associated with demand out of the box. And again, this is configurable, but I think this is something that when I've done implementations of demand management, this is probably what's taken the most time from a planning perspective is to determine like what are the metrics that we want to score our demands on and how then do we do that scoring. Um, if if you're just starting out, again, I'd strongly recommend just, you know, maybe do more of a manual scoring where I would just go into this assessments data and just populate what is my risk, what is my value, or whatever you're using as your as your scoring. Um, and then there's an overall score that's going to calculate and it's basically an average of risk, value, and size uh, to determine a, an overall score. Um, so so we're going to set our impact. So our out of the box, what, what's happening with this value score is it's taking the impact field and taking the financial benefit or financial return and building a score based on those. So basically, the higher your financial return and the higher the impact, it's going to create a higher value score. So again, this is just that's just an out of the box configuration. It's good to understand how it works, but ultimately, each 
customer that I've seen implemented, if they're using the automation to build up these scores, they typically drill into that and, and determine, you know, is that the right way to determine that score? Are, are we, should we use other fields? Should we use a survey? Should we, you know, just, just fill it out uh, manually at first? Um, to determine what those what those uh, that score should be, so I've filled out my fields. I've got my assessment. So I'm going to manually move this to a qualified state. And what you'll see when I do that is that these scores are then getting populated. So we've got a very high value because we had a high return and a high impact. The value is very high because our risk uh, from our from our survey assessment survey that Gracie filled out was very low. The risk score is low, and that's going to lead to a fairly large uh, overall score. Um, for this particular demand. And again, completely configurable. Uh, it's good to understand how it works so that uh, you could then configure it to make sure that you're getting the scoring that's, that is um, appropriate for your organization. All right, so now that I've got this in a qualified state, uh, there's a couple different ways that then you can um, look at that, look at the items that are in a qualified state. We've got our demand workbench, which is our bubble chart, which will show different items. Um, this is everything that's at a qualified state. We can apply some filters here just so that, you know, maybe we want to only see things from the HR portfolio. So we can add a filter here and we're going to say the portfolio is HR. All right, so that should slim down our list a little bit. And basically what we're seeing here is a way to identify once you've done your scoring, we use the risk as the x-axis, the value as the y-axis, and then the size, uh, the t-shirt size is the, the size of the bubble. And from each of these, you can then go in, you could view the demand, and from that, you could potentially approve it. So let's say this is part of a steering committee meeting where you're deciding what's going to move forward. We just potentially approve this demand. Uh, here's our office hours demand. We could view that demand and approve it. From that view, you could also create a project directly. That's something that, uh, you know, you have to decide whether you'd want to have someone create a project directly from this view or force uh, have them make sure it gets to approved first before, before it would actually create that project record. You can also do something what we call the executive override, um, where you can drag the bubble. This is something I typically don't recommend too much simply because, you know, if you're putting in this scoring, uh, you're doing that for a reason and you want to keep those scores. And you could you could have something become a project or, or a, a um, uh, an agile story without moving it, but you can kind of drag and drop things. And you'll see how that's impacting the score there. It's changing the risk and value scores based on how I move it around. And I could actually, uh, if I click on it, I could change the size from here as well, change the size of the bubble. But like I said, I typically recommend against that just because if you're using scoring, you kind of want to keep those those scores in place. Um, the other way that you'd be able to see this is, I think I showed you the scenario planning before, there's also a bubble chart on this view, where if you've got a, a particular business unit and you're planning things out, you would be able to see the demands on a bubble chart here. And again, in here, instead of promoting the project, what you're doing is you can select or deselect things um, to, be, uh, to be executed on. All right, so, uh, so let's move our office hours to approved. So that I mentioned, I showed from the, the bubble chart view that you can, can promote something as a project. You can also do that from here. We could create the project from this related link. I think it's available throughout the life cycle of this demand if you want it, but what we typically recommend is not showing this until you're actually at an approved state. And so then once you create the project from like, let's say this approved demand, that would then create that project record. And if we look at the demand record, we'll see that our cost plans and benefit plans have disappeared. What's happened is they've moved over into our corresponding project record. We'll open that up. And that's where we'll see that the, that, that information has moved over. Our, here we see our cost plans, benefit plans, and resource plans all moved over to this particular project that we promoted from the demand. All right, I think that was all I wanted to go through. Uh, Navadid, is there anything that you noticed that I missed? No, oh, it's it's wonderful, Rob. I think in so little time you covered so much. All yeah. Right. Do we have any other questions related to the demo, or do we? Then we could potentially open it up to just more general questions. 
Now, so far, I'm not seeing anything else inside the chat window. So I would definitely say it's time for us to just open up to anyone who wants to unmute and kind of ask a question directly to Rob about the demo or just, or just in general. We also do have Namita, who's a product success a senior level resource on demand management slash resource management. So any questions related to this uh, topic that we've covered today, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. We have about eight minutes left. So. And thank you all so much for uh, filling in that poll. Definitely everyone, please go ahead and, and submit your um, responses to the couple of questions that are there. It only takes about two minutes. The floor is now open for any customer who wants to unmute and ask a key question. I'll just ask, is there a way to lock that demand workbench so that no one could move those bubbles? Uh, I believe so. I'd have to double check on that, whether we've provided that level of like locking it down. I know you, you have to be of a specific role to be able to move. Right. You have to be the demand manager. But I, have, I think, I, you know, I don't know if you can, can stop the demand managers from like technically doing it, but uh, it's something we could potentially, we could follow up on as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was an idea um, on the idea portal where it was asked long back. So maybe uh, you can also create this idea on the idea portal because mm -hmm. it's the second time I'm hearing this ask. Right. Yeah, I don't think it's technically possible other than you know, basically, yeah, telling demand managers not to do it. I think I don't, and I don't, with it since this is a portal, I'm not sure we can edit that to like remove the option. Um, yeah. Unless I think, Rob, you know, if we do some customization, maybe right. that's the, yeah. Might be, might be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not out of the box. Mm -hmm. Rob, a uh, quick question. On the previous view, you, there was a, you could see the bubble chart and there was another timeline view that looked like it was available. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, this is the, yeah, that scenario planning workbench. So this really combines demands and projects. Um, and it shows a timeline. So these are mostly projects, I think, actually, let me uh, if I change personas. We have a better, so with our, our data, the out of the box, uh, the projects and demands look almost identical. So let me just switch over to a different user quickly where we've, I, we've, uh, right. So yeah, so that demand workbench, or that, I'm sorry, the, the, the scenario planning workbench can be used for, um, both projects and demands, but it, it's, you know, if you're using it from a planning perspective, you typically would want to only have demands there. And so then you'd have your bubble chart that would have all of your demands and your timeline view would show those demands alongside your projects. This is not showing, we should have more demands that are showing along this timeline. Um, but uh, yeah, then you can create scenarios with that. So if you did want to have some different scenarios like as you're doing your annual planning where you'd say, okay, let's, what would happen if we chose to go with these projects versus these other projects or demands, we could do that. And then you could basically, you can select. So here's our, we've got one demand that's out there in this particular example, but you can basically select that demand see how it impacts. If you've got a, a target for that particular year, um, you can see if you've got, if you're using strategies, whether it's aligned to a strategy, uh, we can see whether resource groups are gonna be over allocated based on selecting this particular demand. And then if you do have any projects in flight that let's say you're determining the next year, whether you wanna keep going with them and you decide, oh no, we're gonna deselect that, that would show you if you have any um, actuals that have come through for that project that would now you know, basically be sunk costs um, that, that, that would be there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, any other questions? We have about five minutes left. That's a really good question. Okay. Any final words of wisdom and guidance, Rob or uh, Namita, on the subject matter? I guess one thing I said, I've, I've implemented demand management at several customers, and I, I guess keep it simple if you can. <laughs> I think that's been the big gotcha with, with some customers is they, they want to do a little too much sometimes with the process and makes it, you know, you want a process that users will make, will be easy for them to understand and follow without, without having to have too much training. 
Um, so, you know, that's, and, and this goes for whether it's scoring, whether it's workflow, whether it's what data you collect, just try to keep it as simple as you can. And every time you're doing something that adds to that complexity, just ask yourself the question, is this adding value or is this just something that, you know, we're, we're trying to account for too much? So that, those, those would be my, uh, my final words. Perfect. Amina, anything from you? Any final? No, I think this is wonderful session and it was so interactive, but I want just one um, thing I would like to know from this group of uh, people. Uh, anyone here who is creating an enhancement from the demand uh, in this group or you people are mainly creating projects and agile or safe records from the demand? Oh, we, we create uh, enhancement mm -hmm. from the demand and that's been an issue uh, right now we are trying to move away from directly to directly creating stories okay is there a okay, reason sir. for you no i just wanted to know that uh, if you are creating enhancement directly from the demands then maybe uh, we can set up a call later and have a discussion to see your use case Okay, sounds good. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Looks like Sarah replied, they use Agile yeah. records. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Hi, this is Jay. Uh, we also create enhancements. So our demand is basically connected to projects. It's also connected to incidents and it is also connected to a change request as well. So. For example, if you have about uh, you know 1,000 incidents for a particular CI and it's a recurring incident, right? So we do create it as a demand, which is not a very high priority, but it does connect to uh, uh, demand directly. It has a slight deviation from okay. what Rob explained. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Maybe we we need to connect later. Okay. Hmm. Back to you, Charles. Looks like. All right. Well, it looks like we have one final minute left. Any other final questions, comments, concerns? Looks like everyone's saying it's a good session, so that's good to hear. Definitely, we could always use more time, especially with demand management. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you heard that many a time, but we Absolutely. can never have enough time for this type of conversation. It's where right. the heart of all the work starts. And that's, that's, that's the biggest piece of it. It's where it starts and then how do we dissect it, segregate it out so that we can get it get properly categorized and really flow it from there accordingly. So I definitely invite you, Rob, any uh, anytime if you guys wanted to do a session two or anything like that, maybe later in the year, uh, we can kind of do something like that as well. But I appreciate all of you for your responses in the poll as well as attending this office hour. For those who are listening to the recording, definitely if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be able to respond back accordingly. So thank you all so much. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, everyone.